Hello, and welcome to Nemo's webinar, Collect, Curate, and Communicate, Sharing a Transnational History of Europe. My name is Elizabeth, and I am the Policy Officer at Nemo. As the network for museums in Europe, our main activities include advocating for museums at the European level, providing training opportunities, providing a platform for museums to exchange and learn from each other, and helping museums to cooperate across borders. We are happy to have you with us online today from across Europe and the world as we present today's webinar, facilitated by Plandine Smilanski and Raluca Niamu of the House of European History. Plandine has been at the museum since 2015 and currently coordinates the Communications and Partnerships Department. She also developed and implemented a cultural programming for diverse audiences as a member of the Learning Department. Since 2021, Raluca has worked as a curator and project manager for touring exhibitions at the House of European History. Previously, she was the head of education and communication department at the National Museum of Art of Romania. This webinar will give an overview of the House of European History's endeavor to tell a European story. Together, we will hear how the museum accommodates such diversity and how it contributes to an inclusive understanding of the past, and as a result, inclusive societies today. At the end of the webinar, you will have the opportunity to ask questions in the Q&A round using the chat function. Or, if you prefer, you can join us on stage to ask your questions. Simply indicate this preference in the chat. So without further ado, I will hand this over to Aluka and Blandine to get started. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, and thank you to all the colleagues in NEMO who are giving us this opportunity today to to share a bit our experience, to unpack our, some of our work as a European museum. Um, we will do that in a twofold manner. I will start giving you uh, hopefully some insightful um, information on uh, our approach to collecting, to curating and to communicating history in, uh, in a European way. And then I will, ha I will um, hand over to my colleague Raluca, who is going to present a special project of ours, which we are uh, starting to implement now, and which is really a concrete uh, way in which we try to implement this uh, European mission of ours, and that is our uh, touring exhibition project. So this is a, a little bit how we are gonna uh, organize our talk this morning. Um, for about uh, 15 minutes each. And then we are happy, like Elizabeth said, to answer uh, questions uh, both on the museum's uh, work and approach as a whole, and more specifically on the touring exhibition project we'll present. I would like actually to, to start um, before I had just uh, prepared also the, the, the title again, but Elizabeth mentioned it, she also uh, reminded you uh, what will be the focus of our talk, what are the main questions we are trying to address with our presentation um, about accommodating diversity, presenting history in a transnational way, and how do we address this, um, this idea of uh, diversity and inclusion through our approach to contents and also to uh, outreach. I just thought, um, just to get us started and, and thinking a little bit about uh, a lot of very important concepts for us as museum professionals, which I, which I guess many of you are as well. Um, I wanted to just put on the screen for, uh, for a few seconds um, this definition of what a museum is, which actually many of you uh, may know that there's been a long, very long process of trying to, to come come up with a definition of a, of a museum. Um, and that was a process organized by ICOM. And actually, a few weeks before uh, I started to prepare for this webinar, I received uh, one more uh, ICOM email about the definition uh, issue, where it seemed like there is, uh, there's been already some kind of voting and the, the process is uh, nearing uh, to its end. And so I just, uh, I, I don't know how official yet that definition is. I don't think it's uh, completely finished, but I thought it's interesting just to put it in front of our eyes. And I highlight, highlighted that sentence, which has really um, a lot of the keywords um, of uh, what uh, we are trying to, to 
come to terms with uh, also Nemo as a as a as an organization and and us the House of European History, and very much uh, actually all all of us as contemporary museums as museums of the twenty first century, we share this common goal I think to be open to the public, accessible and inclusive, to to foster diversity and sustainability, and then our my question really for today is how do we do that as a European museum, as a museum with this special mission being uh, European by nature, by which I mean uh, European in its governance, European in, in its outreach, um, and European in its content approach. So that was uh, just uh, for preparing our, ourselves. Then I will uh, go without spending too, too much time on it, because of course you can also uh, visit our websites and uh, there are lots of resources you can uh, use to discover the house. I'll, I'll list a few of them at the end, but still a few facts which uh, you should have in mind um, about the House of European History. We are open for the visitors since May 2017, um, so we are still quite a young museum, I would say. We already received around uh, 600,000 visitors, so I I think I don't need to go back to uh, the, the, the reality of the past two years, uh, which has been, again, something shared by, uh, by all museums uh, worldwide, um, only to say that for us it came, of course, uh, only after a couple of years of existence, so it's been especially um, hard on our um, visitors' numbers. We are a museum under the auspices of the European Parliament, uh, which means that we are academically independent in terms of uh, developing our contents, but we are administered by the European Parliament, so by a political institution. We are a free museum. Uh, I thought that's important to, to mention here um, as well if we are thinking of a, a very uh, basic and direct way to be accessible to the public, to be open to the public. We have a permanent exhibition on recent European history. That's also important um, to say because it's not in the, directly in the name of our museum, we are mainly um, dealing with uh, recent history of the continent. And that is, again, something which uh, we, we very much uh, use also in how to be, make our contents relevant for as broad an audience as possible, because we, we, our narrative uh, line goes all the way to the present day. And then a few, a few of the, 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 the projects we have. We have temporary exhibitions. Uh, we have a touring exhibition project you will hear, learn more about soon. We have an online collection under development. We have a virtual tour that will soon be online. And I should have added here uh, public programs and special projects, uh, which are the tools we try to, to implement to reach out to as, as, as broad a public as possible, and uh, also going beyond uh, what would be our natural audience or most uh, easy to reach. Also to go um, without spending too much time, but still uh, mentioning a few key elements from our mission statement, which is which we really try to use as a roadmap, as a compass in every um, work we do, in every activity we implement. So we aim to become a leading museum on transnational phenomena which have shaped the continent. This idea of, uh, of transnational history is really a, a sort of a theoretical pillar behind our work, uh, starting simply from this idea that uh, a lot of what has happened um, in history uh, has happened actually uh, at a transnational level, uh, although we have uh, a framing of uh, certain of those events and phenomena, which uh, very often uh, is within uh, a, a national uh, limits because of education programs, etc., etc. We try to provide a forum for learning, reflection, and debate. That's the, the three key words we, we, we use um, in terms of uh, how do we communicate uh, history, open to audiences from all generations and backgrounds. Uh, that's, of course, a very broad scope, uh, and uh, it's, not, it's not enough to state it. Uh, you have also to, to of course, uh, reflect on how you break this down into um, concrete audiences and how you, you, how you address uh, all those, uh, those groups. And finally, 
we want to document and preserve European memories of shared historical events and raise awareness about their variety and diversity. So this is really where we come to the core of, um, of what we, we, we want to do, accommodating this uh, diversity, taking that uh, other level from the, from the national to the, to the transnational and uh, creating an awareness of um, similarities, differences, uh, things we share, things that divide us also uh, as Europeans in, uh, in, in a way that is as accessible as possible uh, through museum displays and, and various projects. Then I just uh, listed in a bit um, less, uh, less wordy way than, uh, than what we have in the mission more, uh, more concretely, the challenges the House of European History had to face uh, when it was created, when the project was launched, uh, and even more when the team um, appointed for this project started to work, and the solutions uh, we came up with and we started to implement and keep implementing uh, throughout the, the work. So I, I touched upon that already. Uh, we want to tell a transnational history of Europe, and certainly not a sum of national histories that became quite clear really from the inception of that project when a committee of experts uh, worked already on, on, on what would that House of European History um, look like. Um, of course, we again, we very much live into our uh, 27 present day national realities, be it where we live or where we are born. Um, and in our context, this means uh, um, 27 different national histories which are more often than not competing or at least diverging and that's only to talk about the the, the reality within Europe but you also of course have also the, the, the question of Europe uh, and its relation to the rest of the world Europe and the, the region the neighboring uh, countries etc so this is this was definitely um, a challenge move away from the, the this idea of uh, a sum of national histories then we also evolve in an environment which uh, considers the 24 official languages of the european union as as of equal status um, that was very much also a reality for us to 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 deal with and and definitely a challenge therefore Another very striking characteristic of our museum project when it was born was the lack of a collection, which is um, pretty unusual for a history museum um, to be first a, a project, an idea, but without a, a, a collection uh, to exhibit, um, to, 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 to build on. And finally, this idea that we are a museum in Brussels, we have a a building physically located in, in Brussels, but we want to reach to the whole of Europe. So the solutions um, that, were, uh, that were adopted and that very much became what makes, what gives this museum its unique uh, added value, I would say. Uh, well, that was uh, in terms of content approach to, to, to set clear criteria criteria for the stories and the objects exhibited. We'll come back to that uh, in the next slide. And very much this academic independence, which I mentioned already, which uh, we really have to, to safeguard uh, and which the institution will belong to uh, safeguards uh, for us as really um, a guarantee for, uh, for being legitimate to tell what we tell, to present the history as, as we present it. We created a permanent exhibition um, which is multilingual so we, we when you come to the house of European history you do not find um, the exhibition text you do not find uh, the, the identification of the objects and all the, the narration all the interpretation on the walls or in the showcases but in a tablet in a multilingual tablet where you choose your language and um, of course this is only apparently a technical problem which we overcome with a technical solution because of course, languages reflect a lot of uh, the sensitivities they evoke, associations, etc. So it's, it's, it really means something to, to provide our visitors with um, a whole experience of, uh, of uh, European history in their own language. 
objects, the lack of collection, that is, uh, I'll come back to it as well, but uh, that resulted in, well, two, two parallel developments actually. One being that uh, we started to build our own collection, the team appointed already in, uh, in 2012, and that grew afterwards, did a huge work and a unique collecting effort throughout Europe, but also that meant that our permanent exhibition was uh, built and still largely relies on loans from other institutions in Europe, from national history museums to local regional museums or, or even uh, private collections. And reaching out to the whole of Europe, well, that's, um, that has lots of implications, but I would, I would mention one which, again, became uh, very familiar to many of our museums uh, with the start of the pandemics, which worked for us really as a, as a, as a sort of a stimulus to go virtual, to go online and to develop our uh, digital strategy in order to be able to also talk to people who would not necessarily come and visit the museum in Brussels. So this, this was a little bit um, presenting that as a, as a list. Um, but now I'll go back maybe in more details and with, with a, a couple more examples to the, the, the sort of um, uh, triptych we, we, want, we used to title this, uh, this webinar as well. So collecting, um, I mentioned something very interesting and, and quite unique, which took place roughly between 2012 and 2015, which are all those visits. I, I found the, back the figures here, 200 visit, 250 visits in nearly 30 countries to source and evident, like they would say, uh, and I'm talking here of my uh, colleagues who were there uh, at the very beginning of the project, mostly uh, museum curators and historians from, from all over Europe going to small and big museums, uh, capital cities and, and, and little uh, cities really everywhere around Europe, sometimes storage facilities, not necessarily collections that were exhibited, um, to find those objects that would uh, help us tell our message and especially to bring them into relation with each other, objects coming from different uh, collections. So I've uh, if you if you if you're interested uh, to read our the book we published about the making of of the museum creating the house of urban history you have for instance a very short uh, easy to read article from uh, my colleague uh, Christine Dupont who tells about a visit to a small city in Bulgaria uh, where she was taken around the city by one local museum curator uh, who organized for her a collecting action among citizens of the city uh, about tourism during the communist period. And some of the objects that she was able to get uh, in this way are, um, are exhibited in our section about um, uh, mobility and tourism uh, in the 50s and the, and the 60s in Europe. So that's just one, one story to illustrate that, uh, that process. Collecting is, of course, about um, looking for the for the right objects that tell the right message, but it's also a lot of procedures, uh, you know that. So collecting in a pan-European fashion meant also, means also, because we, we, we are, this is not over, addressing a variety of professional standards, backgrounds, and mentalities, uh, and yeah, overcoming a lot of um, different ways to, to, to manage collections, to, uh, have objects traveling, etc. So this is also a huge endeavor for our team, and that involves not only curators, definitely not, but many other departments of our museum to uh, to, to address that. And finally, the the, the essence of what uh, we are looking at in those uh, with, with this collecting effort are, of course, objects of museum quality, complementary to one another, and with a European dimension. What we mean by that can be two things. Either they by themselves um, tell, a Euro tell something uh, about a European event or phenomenon, but that can be also when they are placed uh, next to other objects uh, that they take on this uh, other meaning and they are sort of uh, Europeanized in their, in their meaning. I just uh, have one slide here that shows you um, one specific showcase from our permanent exhibition which can illustrate that there, there would have been many, many different examples I could have taken. 
um, I just took this one and that is um, our section on uh, Europe in the 19th century, the political transformations um, that uh, Europe went through in that, uh, in that century. Uh, and the way the, the ideas of the, of the French Revolution spread throughout uh, the continent and um, encouraged and, and then triggered uh, revolutionary movements uh, in several regions of Europe. And what you see here are, for instance, objects, the, the, the plates or the, the, the glasses, objects uh, from different uh, countries featuring national heroes um, uh, or even just national symbols. And that is a way to show how uh, to build national identities that would claim more autonomy within a largely imperially ruled Europe, how those national figures were uh, convoked, were used, were mobilized to build national identities. And that was definitely a, a, a process happening in many different uh, parts of the continent. So as you see, few objects with a very national, um, uh, uh, of a very national nature, featuring the national heroes. And now you see Vasco da Gama, you see Garibaldi, um, brought together, put next to one another, juxtaposed in a way, but to, to, to create this broader narrative. So that was uh, one, one concrete example. When we talk about uh, curating, uh, which is, I already uh, also mentioned a bit when talking about collecting, but there are three criteria which um, have been uh, sort of uh, put out, uh, stated like this, um, when the whole uh, curation process started for building the permanent exhibition of the House of European History, what would be the main elements we would uh, check um, the the, the, the the history that we were going to include in our uh, in our exhibition uh, that should be there for everything we mentioned, and that is the fact that the process, event, or development should originate in Europe, uh, have spread across Europe, and be still of relevance today. So these are sort of metal, like methodological elements, but they uh, and of course they are a bit rigid and and. This is why I, I call them uh, something purely methodological, but they are here really to help us answer a key question, which is given the choice to give very little room to the national narratives or to the remembrance around it, how do you still create a sense of belonging? How do you st still make your contents um, relevant and uh, and uh, Touch, touch upon people's uh, yes, emotions or also intellectual uh, expectations with a transnational content, with an exhibition about the, the, the broader, uh, the wider phenomenon. And that the, the answers to, to, to that very much are, well, I mentioned it already, the connection to the present. It's one of the criteria you see here, um, starting from from the present time, or at least looking for the links with the present time. And of course, being a museum of recent history helps you do that. It's also a question of uh, trying to create an eye-opening experience for the visitor by showing, by making him or her realize that something that happened in a specific context he or she is familiar with actually has uh, echoes or has uh, links with things happening elsewhere as well. It's also the, the, um, the constant um, effort not to create a theological exhibition, an exhibition that would show the European Union, the European project, uh, uh, to call it more broadly, as the culmination of the history of the, of the continent. Um, and I've got a, a slide afterwards just with a few objects talking about this history of the European Union, European his integration history, has, as it's called, and, uh, and how we try not to do that. And then one more element to, to talk about this, um, making our, our contents uh, accessible, inclusive, and, uh, and compelling for people uh, while moving away from a 
a more traditional uh, frame of, of exhibiting history, and that's the memory um, idea. I mentioned it already when I, I mentioned the mission, this idea of shared European memories. So we try very much not to show only what happened in the past, but also very much um, how it's remembered. So it's not only, uh, and how it's been remembered, because remembrance also has a, a history of itself. So it's not only uh, how did the Holocaust happen, but how was it then remembered in various European countries? How did those countries come to terms with that uh, painful memory and, and very often responsibility? Uh, it's, n it's not only um, what happened during uh, the communist dictatorships in a part of Europe, but it's also when, after the, Soviet of the, the collapse of the Soviet Union, how were European memories reunited? How did they uh, meet each other or, or not in a, in a post-1989 uh, context? I have to end actually here because otherwise I'm taking too much time from my colleague Haluka. These were just a few objects talking about something very specific for our museum, which is uh, collecting about uh, European integration history. And I just wanted to show here how, but I'm, I'm not going into, to go into the details of the objects, but how we try to strike this balance between appraisal and criticism, between uh, uh, a project that uh, um, was met with a lot of support and also a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, criticism uh, through time. And I was going to also uh, end with um, something a bit more about the communicating aspect um, of our work on transnational history, but I mentioned already the multilingual idea. The idea of multiple perspectives, which also appear in our, um, in our mission, that is really a strength of our museum, which we believe to provide a space which is safe to address certain issues which at more national more regional, more national, or more local level can be very sensitive and still painful. And finally, this active learning approach, um, which uh, you see here, for instance, an example, it's, it's the, the school resources we prepare for uh, students that come to our museum. And that is very much um, taking this, uh, starting from this idea of questioning the past to understand the, the present. And finally, the collaboration, the, the, we try to be as open as possible to what our visitors think of our museum, but also what other institutions, other organizations, and to react upon, uh, upon that. I will, I had here, but I think that's more for when you want to know more, um, use the resources. We have all the audio files of our ex permanent exhibition content on our website. We have a magazine which, gi which gives uh, stories on our objects. We have a lot of content on our website, on our YouTube channel, and we have publications. We have a guidebook. Uh, catalogs for our temporary exhibitions and uh, this book I mentioned about the making of, of our uh, exhibition. And lots of projects going on where we try to uh, experiment with some outreach participatory um, approaches to, to, to museum work and one very remarkable one which is our touring exhibition project and uh, Hanukkah I will now give you the floor. Sorry for going beyond the time I gave myself, and um, over to you, Raluca. Thank you, Blondine, for this uh, very interesting presentation about our museum. is the perfect uh, background for what we are going to talk uh, next. Um, all, exactly from the beginning of reflecting about a museum of Europe, the, the thinkers thought about touring exhibition as a very nice way and effective way to uh, spread the information about this museum in Europe. But it was possible to have a strategy about touring exhibition only last year when we have developed this general strategy about touring exhibitions in general. And uh, this is the first uh, study case, uh, Fake for Real, that uh, was a temporary exhibition in uh, the House of European History in Brussels, is going to be adapted, is going to be a tour in uh, Europe starting with uh, next year. I'm going to present you a little bit the concept of this exhibition and also some details about the practicality of this project. 
if you as representatives of uh, museums in Europe are interested to host this exhibition, we are very open to this. We have just started the campaign of finding uh, host museums in Europe. So after this webinar, we can uh, stay in touch and um, talk about the details if you are interested to be such a museum. First of all, as I've told you, uh, we are adapting the concept of the temporary exhibition with the same title that uh, took place in Brussels uh, last year. The content is uh, about one introduction and 16 uh, case studies that cover six topics of significant fakes and forgeries throughout European history. The case studies are put in chronological order, but also grouped according of types of forgeries, which reflect the aspirations and anxieties of specific epochs. It starts with medieval times and finishes with current issues. As Blondine mentioned, we are trying all the time to be in contact with our visitors to find the most relevant information and objects and stories in order for the contemporary visitors to be interested in and to have a... Um, 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 nice experience visiting our exhibitions. The aims of the exhibitions, first of all, it addressed one of the current most discussed subjects, fake news, disinformation, and puts it in a broad historical context. As uh, Blondine mentioned, we are part of European Parliament, and uh, now the Digicom of the European Parliament is developing a strategy against disinformation. Because uh, we passed uh, the pandemic, we have started uh, uh, to be uh, to have uh, the same issues uh, about the war in Europe. So this subject, unfortunately, remains one very relevant topic for uh, European history nowadays. The exhibition should foster critical thinking and accentuate the need of fact checking. It should raise awareness of the relevance of expertise and encourage visitors to seek out reliable source of information. The narrative of the exhibition, uh, the most important thing is that we are surrounded all the time by, by disinformation and fake news, but we are not condemned to be deceived. This is the starting point. Then, each era fakes what it values the most. This is one of the main um, conclusion of the narrative of the exhibition. Although certain types of fakes existed all throughout human history, counterfeit money, art forgery, fake documents, each era experienced particular types of fakes. We have uh, put a lot of questions about fakes and forgeries in Europe during uh, the history. What have been the mechanisms behind significant forgeries and hoaxes in history? And the exhibition tries to have some uh, answers about this. How could some fake news claim validity for a very long time? And how were they exposed in the end? Can we defend ourselves from the mass of false information? How to defend the role of experts in the world in which catchy, loudly expressed uh, statements become viral in the media? And again, this subject is uh, really significant nowadays in uh, the era of uh, internet. Uh, sorry, I can't, yeah, it's this one. The objectives of the narrative, to show that fake news has a long-standing tra uh, tradition in history. It is not something new. The visitors will be surprised to find very old cases. To allow the visitors to reflect on the human tendency to believe in certain untrue statements. To raise awareness of the need for critical thinking and fact-checking. Fact to underline the role of experts who are so often undetermined in today's world. Here you have the structure of the exhibition. As you can see, there are uh, six uh, topics. And for each, uh, the curator, Ioana Urbanek, together with Andrea uh, Mork and Simina Bandico, founded very relevant stories that are presented in a very accessible way and that um, uh, start with uh, the fake, the fake uh, and the forgeries in religion, the, f the first uh, uh, item. Then understanding the word is about invention of printing. 
that uh, um, allowed uh, the humanity to bring uh, the truth, but also a lot of uh, uh, fake uh, stories. And we are talking here about written uh, stories in books, but also about some photos, contemporary photos. Then uniting and dividing is about ethnic and national identities in the 18th and 19th century, about the patriotic fakes and the genuine historical discoveries. Fighting war is mainly about the Second World War, is about the choices of whom to trust, and about the crimes covered up by the totalitarian regimes. Fake and fortune is about profit, one of the main reasons for producing forgeries during the history. The last section, the era of post-truth, um, uh, consists only in uh, interactives, games for children and adults as well, where the visitors can uh, test themselves if they can discover what is fake and what is truth. And uh, in this way, uh, trying to understand the psychological way of um, being tempted to believe fake in certain uh, situation. As about the uh, planning of the Turing exhibition, we uh, are aiming to reach the visitors that are not able to come in Brussels and to visit physically our exhibitions here. That's why we are thinking about nine European uh, uh, countries, members of the European Union, ideally, from the northern part to southeastern uh, Europe. We have started to identify these visitors that are not coming in Brussels, uh, analyzing our surveys with the um, uh, real physical visitors in Brussels. As about the time frame of the Turing exhibition, the first one will be in autumn 2023, and the last one will start in December 2026. We intend to have the exhibition three months minimum to each destination. As a border target group, we are um, focusing on urban citizens from secondary school students to educated adults aged between 30 45 years old. But as you know, this is only the focus group, but we are aiming to, to reach uh, many more tar um, groups of uh, visitors. Sorry. As about fake for real in Brussels, uh, even if uh, the pandemic uh, struck us all, we had great visibility and enthusiastic feedback from the media, talking about fake news and talking about this complex uh, process of uh, believing fakes, even if uh, um, the reality is uh, totally different. Uh, indeed, the exhibition had a very um, important uh, echoes in, um, in media. Satisfaction of our visitors, most of whom were visiting HEH for the first time. Public events and educational programs addressed to schools and teachers. All this is uh, despite the challenges of mandatory booking, smaller groups visiting the museum, absence of tourists and no guided tours because of the pandemic. The Turing exhibition will be a turnkey exhibition. That means that the House of European History will provide the hosting venues all the physical assets required. So it will be a whole exhibition with all the design, all the panels, all the text translated in local languages for our museum hosts. It will be a condensed exhibition with approximately 60 objects from the House of European History's collection, multimedia, games, and mechanical interactives. This was. If you are interested in uh, hosting this exhibition, here you have my contact details. And uh, I hope uh, the exhibition will be interested for um, um, historical museums, national library museums, literature museums, uh, media museums. And uh, we are interested to find out who is interested in this project and to develop discussions about how we can um, uh, materialize it in um, a touring exhibition in your country. Thank you.
Thank you both so much for this uh, wonderful presentation, this um, dive into the background of the House of European History, and of course, uh, the temporary exhibition, which is set to travel. So exciting. Um, I actually, I failed to mention in my introduction that I actually had the pleasure of visiting House of European History not too long ago, while this temporary exhibition uh, was ongoing, and it was really a wonderful experience. So I can um, only personally recommend to the participants here that if you do find it in your country or perhaps even in your museum, uh, it's certainly worthwhile for a visit. Um, but yeah, I would like to open up the floor, of course, for questions. Uh, you can either type your questions into the chat, um, or if you'd like, uh, you can indicate in the chat that you would like to come on stage with us, and uh, we can address your questions live all together. Um, I did have a couple questions myself, though, uh, listening along through the presentation. Um, Initially, uh, one question that came up uh, for the first half of the presentation uh, when we were focusing on the House of European History as an institution itself. Um, Blandin, you mentioned uh, the mission statement of the museum, and I was wondering if you had any further detail on how that came about, how it was developed, and whether this is something that's you know, somewhat set in stone, or if it is something that uh, is revisit, uh, revisited and reiterated, um, if that's, you know, part of the process as time goes on. The mission statement, yes. So this is, <clears throat> sorry, this is, there's, it's currently a text, um, quite a long one that uh, features on our website. When you go uh, under About Us, you find uh, a paragraph on our vision and then a, a mission, which has several paragraphs where we try to, to, to say uh, all what we are about um, in, in a few sentences. That was developed actually uh, um, just after the museum opened, once the team was really established and uh, we entered this uh, really phase of operation. So it was really a, a collective effort from um, the team, the, the people uh, working on the, on the team of the House of European History, and then directly with our academic committee, which is um, actually a, a, um, uh, an air or a, 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 there was first an, a committee of experts, actually, when the idea of the museum was launched, um, historians, museum professionals from different European countries, that was the, the, the key element, of course, to be as pan-European as possible. Um, they, they wrote a document uh, called the conceptual basis, where the main lines, uh, uh, the main uh, elements on which uh, the, the museum would be built uh, featured. So there was, for instance, a concrete example, uh, to have a museum not only of uh, Europe understood strictly as uh, the countries of the European Union, but really the continent and Europe as a project that was already in there, uh, but also the idea to focus on recent history, the, the mandate for the temporary exhibitions to go look into, um, uh, to deepen or, or explore other uh, parts of history. Um, and so I would say the mission uh, takes both from this conceptual basis, uh, which existed already a few years before the museum opened, and from all the process of, of creating the museum, of building the museum. And just after the opening, we, we tried to, to pause a little bit and to reflect and to, to, to say, OK, how can we best capture uh, uh, all what has been uh, put in place in those uh, few years and very much looking uh, where we want to go, where, where we are heading at. And that's where, uh, to answer the, the second part of your question, this is definitely, so it was written by the team, it was approved by our um, academic uh, committee, or amended and approved by our academic committee, but also our uh, hierarchy uh, in the European Parliament. But this is definitely something, for instance, we've been looking at it again uh, recently as we've conducted um, Focus, uh, with the help of an external company, uh, focus groups and surveys among people to, um, to look into the image of the House of European History, the, 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 the knowledge people have of the museum, but also their, what they think the museum is uh, if they haven't visited it and, and what, it, what is their experience actually once they visit it. And that makes us think that um, there, there may be 
better ways to 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 formulate certain of our goals and 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 uh, part of our mission because this mission statement is clearly for external people to try and, and understand what the what the museum is That's wonderful. So not only is it somewhat of a living document, but also it was very collective, creative process. And I mean, also from my limited experience at your museum, um, I also got the notion that um, the staff there is also quite diverse. You know, you have um, a wonderful representation across Europe. And so I imagine that there are a lot of, you know, backgrounds and experiences that are brought to the table, which is great. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, no, I, I should have mentioned it probably, but this, uh, of course, the, the European nature of the museum uh, sta starts or is, is, is also relying very much on uh, the different nationalities uh, of the staff, you're right. And I, I mentioned that brings in a lot of, um, uh, that enriches very much our work because, uh, yeah, everybody brings different uh, trainings, different, uh, so, and, and that is definitely in the recruitment of the museum team uh, a criterion. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that um, folds in very well to a question from Xavier um, here, which is uh, about the content and um, whether uh, within your exhibitions, whether the content is exactly the same in all languages. And uh, he is asking if you can um, describe the process of creating the texts, choosing the angles, and especially on some of the touchy subjects. Um, you know, with uh, with some of the more sensitive histories uh, that are that is shared across Europe, um, there is the suspicion that um, there's a lot of competing points of views on certain historical events, and um, so of course, yes. it can be a bit challenging. This question is almost uh, it, it, it's 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 so much. There is so much in it. You know, I, I don't, almost wanted to, to give you the book that we have on, on creating the house, and but uh, well, it's it's actually a very thick book, so I'm, I'm not sure you would. Uh, uh, no matter how interested in the in the museum you are, um, so texts exactly this, really the the text writing process. We have uh, we are lucky to be able to count on um, I would say almost an army of translators because we work with the Directorate General uh, for Translation at the European Parliament because uh, you you know that all the workings of the European Parliament also happen in twenty four languages. So they are uh, the colleagues uh, we work with for uh, translating uh, all our exhibition texts. The working language to, to create the initial briefs and exhibition texts uh, when, we, when we curate uh, the exhibitions is English. So there is, you still need to start from a, from, a, yeah, from a common basis because there's a lot, that's when there's a lot of discussion, of course, of what to include, what to leave out, uh, uh, how to present this or that. But then there is a lot of back and forth between the translators and the curators again, who master uh, a, a lot of different languages. So that what comes back in the other language is translated by, um, I would say, um, experts, but more, more technical exp experts in the field of translation not experts in the field of history necessarily. Some of them combine both, but uh, that's not the majority. Th that, that there is then again a, um, a, a process of uh, checking against the initial messages, the initial concepts that uh, were brought in, uh, if that was preserved, if that is still there. So this is a very, very um, uh, delicate, delicate. I don't know if you say that in English, but uh, process. But this is really the heart of uh, uh, cu yeah, curating an exhibition uh, European wide. That really touches upon the, the yeah the essence of uh, of that, and the touchy subjects. Well, th th there is even first a first layer is I remember um, our previous director uh, who, who who was the. the the one leading the team pre-opening, uh, Taya Vangal, was always saying that another team would have done another exhibition. So definitely there were a lot of choices to make, uh, starting from the very broad ones of uh, whether to go for a chronological exhibition or a thematic exhibition or how to mix both, etc. And what, what, so what to include, what not to include, there were, I told you, a, a set of criteria that were, um, that were chosen and uh, trying to stick to as much as possible. 
And the touchy subjects, I would say the, 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 the attention was very much on uh, showing the different perspectives, uh, trying to really include, uh, to, to always make, make the visitor aware that, uh, um, of course, there, there are the facts, but there have, are also, on the one hand, the experiences of people that lived through those uh, the periods, uh, and so very often quite differently, whether they were from different regions of Europe or different social backgrounds, etc. Uh, um, and also uh, how they've been perceived, interpreted, and ultimately remembered. Um, so trying to keep that uh, that multi perspective approach, and it's not easy, and it's and we have to redo it all the time. We have to think again, to look again at our, at what we we, we put. We've presented to the visitors, and how to make it even more multi-perspective is, is is a is a constant uh, concern, of course. Yeah, you know, I think that is um, equally challenging as it is important uh, to be able to create that, you know, transparency when discussing some of the more sensitive topics, and uh, yeah, give space uh, a balanced space for different perspectives and also the facts, as you said, because um, that you know, leaves room to have a discussion, which uh, can be so important, these kinds of things. And to like, like it. for instance, we have, um, I mean, there, there would be a few examples to take, but there, 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 I remember there was a discussion on the, um, the interwar period, as it's uh, called, a posteriori, and how to present uh, th this period, which can be seen as a, a period of uh, authoritarianism rising throughout Europe, but also a period for, if you look at Central and Eastern Europe, it's the period of, of, uh, of democratic blossoming and of modernity uh, really uh, um, uh, yeah, developing in those newly independent countries, etc. So, so how, how do you, that, that's just one example, uh, what kind of uh, choices you make, uh, and then it comes down to, to again, to objects, to text, to scenography also, uh, that, you, that you try to accommodate um, um, th those different realities or the, or the different ways, the reality of, a, 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 of one decade or two decades uh, was, was lived through by, by different uh, people of Europe. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's see, we have a very uh, straightforward question here. Um, whether there's already an established relationship between your museum and Europeana? Yes, absolutely. They, we, they, we identified them from the beginning as an important player and, uh, and potentially partner for our museum. There, was already li there were already links uh, in the making period when uh, the, the before the opening, you saw the, I, saw a, I showed a photo with a display of a World War I postcard. I didn't comment on it, but uh, uh, showing uh, postcards from uh, soldiers fighting from the front, from all over Europe and beyond. That, for instance, was um, uh, sourced through the, you may remember that Europeana had a big collecting campaign around the, the centenary of, uh, of World War I. So we worked with them to source some of our objects and mainly those uh, and mainly those uh, those postcards. Uh, we had one uh, collecting action at the museum when European organized uh, their migration the collecting campaign on migration some years ago. Uh, and we are actually now working uh, to prepare um, an online uh, version of our poster exhibition, which is currently uh, on display at the House of European History. Uh, Europeana has those uh, very nice online exhibitions, uh, and we'll do so. We'll do a, a, a shorter version of our physical exhibition in Brussels uh, for the Europeana website. And yeah, we're we're looking at more more possibilities for cooperation. So definitely, yeah, it's wonderful. Um... So we have another question that relates uh, to um, to the text, to the translation, um, which, uh, yeah, of course, um, as you said before, I mean, it sounds like um, quite an endeavor, uh, quite a procedure um, with back and forth with these uh, with these translations, um, which seems to have been very successful so far. Um, but the question is, um, you know, evaluating uh, the risk of um, texts, which can be very dense. Um, to the point where you know it's still legible, um, has has there been much trouble? The 
density of our text. Yeah, I, I mean, it's it's um, conci conciseness is all the time. We we have very strict uh, guidelines when we write exhibition texts, of course, to be to be short, to be to the point. But that I think that's the the, the reality of uh, of any anybody who writes uh, texts for exhibition. Um, in, a, in our case, well, I think that there, there is a thing which is that the, the static point would be would be still the object itself, uh, and and that that helps you to really focus. I would say, um, in, and then there is a there is a, a big work of starting from a body of text and 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 working through the concepts, working through the phrasing to try to, to, to really get to just to the, to the essence of it. So again, uh, this is the, the, yeah, the, the talent of copywriters and people who, are, who, who write this kind of text. Um, we actually feel, well, this is, I don't know, I don't know if the person asking the question uh, had the opportunity to, to come to the museum, to go through the exhibition, to, to, we try also to do something we call content layering. So we try to give a different um, entry point in the content. You could go directly to a, to a and that layering uh, happens through a, a, a categorization of text, uh, you know, section text, uh, all the way to uh, object text. You can, and, and also mixing audio and uh, written. Um, and you could start from the object, you could go directly to the, object, the, the text about the object, or you can be more interested uh, in those intro texts, which really give, try to give uh, uh, a sense of uh, of what the period uh, or what the phenomenon addressed um, is about. So there is these are some of the things we try to 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 use throughout our exhibition to, like you say, make it. Uh, We seem to have um, lost both of our presenters suddenly. They will be back in just a moment. Here we are. <laughs> I, yeah, um, I was going yeah. for a while. Sorry. <laughs> oh, totally fine. Um, yeah, you know, this this was also something that I reflected on um, as I went through the permanent uh, exhibition at House of European History. Um, not only did I feel that it was very um, possible, you know, as an individual to make my choices of how I wanted to experience it, um, but, you know, the use of, of the audio and everything. Um, yeah, many opportunities, as you were saying, with this content layering. And um, also what you said earlier about this procedure back and forth with the with the expertise on the historical side versus the translation side. I mean, sounds like a, a long process, but definitely worthwhile if you want to be able to, you know, get the story across in a lot of different ways, a lot of different opportunities. Um, we we have another uh, question here um, related to the fact, or uh, um, yeah, this this individual is stating. Sherry, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly, um, says that the House of European History is not as known as it could be in Greece and um, wonders whether there are plans in the works um, to expand, you know, communication strategies and, you know, um, uh, you know, propping up uh, uh, this museum and um, also it specifically mentions um, fake for real as a traveling exhibition that this could be a way forward so is there are there plans to branch off of this touring exhibition uh case study pilot approach um and develop the communication strategy of the museum yeah i mean th this brings us back uh, nicely to the project of touring exhibition which we've uh, we wanted to present to you in this uh, in this webinar because we we do realize that we have um a problem uh, getting known really ac across Europe uh, because um, that's a very ambitious goal, of course, uh, to and we are, uh, uh, okay, I, I, I said we're lucky to be part of a bigger institution that also supports us resource-wise in many ways, but ultimately we are, we are um, uh, a museum team of uh, 50, 60 people and uh, there's only... Uh, a certain amount of uh, workforce we can uh, we can put in our communication, uh, and when you think of the, the, the 
yeah, this the scope of uh, trying to address to the whole of Europe and uh, and to talk to all Europeans that uh, that makes it very very challenging. Uh, we we try very much to to rely on um, what we call org uh, multipliers, organizations, institutions that could help us have this uh, national outreach, this outreach in in uh, in in, uh, in other in countries. Which, uh, which we can't necessarily have just relying on our own uh, forces. So for instance, if you talk about schools, uh, we work with organizations like uh, Europe CLIO, the European Association of History Educators, or Eat Winning, which is a, a, an initiative of, uh, of the Commission. Um, that's, that's uh, some of the, yeah, these are the, the, the ways we try to, to overcome this, this challenge we have, this difficulty we have to be, uh, to be a European museum, and we, we are we really hope that um, our digital strategy, which we start implementing with the online collection, with the virtual tour, uh, we have also an ongoing project on the history of waste in Europe, where we start working with co-creating really content uh, with other museums, and yeah, and the touring exhibition. Uh, that is really a big project for us in for the coming years. It's become really a priority. This is why it's really crucial for us. That you hear this uh, uh, this message, Raluca uh, sent. That you share it among you. We saw also in the chat some uh, some suggestions uh, you, that were made to us uh, to contact some uh, some networks, um, because definitely it's uh, it will be th this fake for real exhibition is is really a can really bring to your to your countries and to your museums what we try to do by uh, by. Uh, yeah, with this idea of transnational history, which is even even more sh a shared history, and it is there in this temporary exhibition very much. So when you if you if you if you see fake for real, you really get to understand uh, what the house of European history is about. I think. Yes, I mean not only a shared history, but um, uh, quite a shared challenge that we all have, and I think that really makes a difference when you are facing uh, you know such. Um, such a challenge as that to know that um, it's something collectively faced, something that that we're all working on in Europe and beyond, uh, facing you know disinformation and whatnot. Um, somewhat branching off of that, um, maybe I ask uh, Raluca specifically. Um, I have a question from a colleague of mine here in in the Nemo office. Um, you know about setting up a, a transnational touring exhibition. Um, you know if you can give us. Um, a bit more information on, you know, what the what the barriers for entry of such a thing in terms of being a partner for that, being a host museum. Is this applicable to smaller museums? Do you already have an idea of, of you know, what's going to be required? I, I mean, of course, I'm sure it's extensive, but, um, you know, so, some a little peek. <laughs> Of course. Uh, first of all, as I, I told you before, we intend to reach uh, some countries from uh, the Baltic states to Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, Greece, Spain, Italy. But we are not uh, very fixed in this list. The idea is uh, just to reach the visitors that uh, are not uh, usually coming in Brussels to visit our museums. Then, of course, we prefer to um, collaborate with the big museums in big uh, cities. But again, this is not a very um, fixed idea. It's just uh, the, um, uh, the opportunity to address to a wide audience, not necessarily in a very small museum. But we are also interested, for example, in uh, European cultural capital in Europe because uh, during uh, these events uh, uh, the audience could be really wide. On the other side, of course, we just want to collaborate with museums or centers that uh, uh, have uh, museum functions uh, where we have uh, conservation conditions, for example, for our objects, where there is a, a learning department or at least um, uh, one or two educators that could uh, implement the learning methodology because we intend to develop such a methodology and to meet uh, our uh, um, uh, colleagues from other museums to share it and uh, to try together to find the best way to have uh, educational programs in the exhibition because the learning aims of this exhibition are really important uh, for us. 
so we are very open but um, each case is different so uh, a discussion is uh, uh, is very important uh, to to take place and we can share our needs and uh, we should uh, meet also the needs of the uh, host museum so we should uh, find somewhere in the middle in order to um, uh, aim to to focus on our aims but on the other side also to uh, meet the needs of um, the other museums in Europe. Wonderful. So I'm hearing case by case uh, basis, um, but also targeting, you know, <clears throat> countries where you haven't seen as many visitors and then potentially also areas where you're going to have a wider audience. <clears throat> and of course, prioritizing, uh, you know, an education department or learning uh, goals within the museum. So, but of course, as you said, case by case, open to discussion. Great. Um, well, in case, uh, unless we have other questions coming in, since we are already a bit over time, um, I think I would end with uh, this last uh, statement here in the chat that we have that um, I'm just going to read from Javier. Uh, again, apologies if the name is incorrectly pronounced. Um, House of European History has gone to the top of my list of places to visit as soon as possible. What an interesting and challenging way to propose multi-layered and polyvocal narratives. Congratulations. <laughs> so um, yeah, I think uh, this is a good place to end unless um, either of our speakers would like to have a last word. No, okay. Well, um, thank you all so much uh, for your attention here today. Um, very interesting and um, hoping to hear more about this case study touring exhibition. Wishing you all the best and a lot of success. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye bye.